On today's Prophecy in the News, we're going to go back to our study of the book of Enoch. Now, we've been putting our studies in Enoch in our magazine each month since February 2009. This is the August 2009 issue of Prophecy in the News, and we have our concluding study on Enoch's book of the parables. Gary Stearman is here to discuss with me this ancient document. Well, J.R., Enoch is important to uh, listeners today, to Bible students today, because he wrote about the time in which we're living, the time at or before the Great Tribulation. And the Jews uh, attributed to Enoch uh, the ability to write and record historical events. A lot of people argue and they say, well, writing is a relatively late invention. Uh, that some, some will even say that Moses didn't know how to write. He simply dictated what he received from God and others wrote it down later on. J.R., uh, if we're to believe the book of Enoch, Enoch wrote and he lived long before Moses. I've been studying the book of Jubilees for the last few weeks and I came across a little writing in the book of Jubilees, which by the way I do not uh, do not believe is actually written by an angel. It purports to be written by Moses, dictated by an angel to him, and Moses wrote it on top of Mount Sinai. I, I don't really believe that. And you, you can, you know, decide for yourself when you read the book of Enoch. But there's something that the, that, or, or pardon me, the book of Jubilees, but there's something about the book of Jubilees uh, that I, I do find interesting. And it's the, the fact that the book of Jubilees does go back over 2,000 years. It was written by some rabbi or some Jew. Mm -hmm. It was a part of Jewish literature. In fact, it was even treasured by the rabbis and several copies of it were found among the Dead Sea Scrolls. Well, among the writings of the ancient book of Jubilees is a description of Enoch. Mm. <laughs> How about that? It, it's in verse 17 here where you start out uh, says this, and I quote, Speaking of Enoch, he was the first among men that are born on earth who learned writing and knowledge and wisdom and who wrote down the signs of heaven according to the order of their months in a book that men might know the seasons of the years according to their order of their separate months. In other words, he was an educated man, a learned man, a literate man, and he could write. Yes, amazing. Uh, so the writing that he had, he had to have some kind of language and an alphabet and to be the seventh from Adam. And, and by the way, if he was the first man who did this, mm -hmm. where did the alphabet come from? Uh -huh. you know, and was Adam illiterate? <laughs> Could Adam read and write? Evidently not. Seth? Evidently not. But because Seth was a godly man and from him came, uh, from his lineage came Enoch, the seventh from Adam, Enoch was given this alphabet and he learned to read and write. Verse 19 says that he wrote down what was and what will be he saw in a vision. And he placed this testimony, this writing of the book of Enoch, on earth for all the children of men and for their generations. So it's fascinating to see that he was the one who used an alphabet to write. And of course, mm -hmm. In the book of Jubilees, they say that he wrote in Hebrew, the Hebrew language, mm -hmm. which of course I, I, I don't doubt. I think Enoch wrote everything in Hebrew. This is before the flood. This is hundreds of years before the flood. I'm talking about when Adam was um, 650 or 60 years old, you know. Mm -hmm. And so Enoch learned to write. And then he also says that he took to himself a wife. Her name was Edna. Now, you don't find the name Edna anywhere in the Bible or in any no. other ancient writings. But the book of Jubilees gives the name of the wives, and so her name was Edna. I thought that was interesting. Of course, her son was Methuselah. And verse 21 says, He was with the angels of God the six Jubilees of years. That'd be about 300 years. And that's, that concurred to what the Bible says, and that the angels showed him everything that is on earth and that is in the heavens. Mm -hmm. And then Gary... <clears throat> He yeah. testifies to these fallen angels. 
amazing that he would do that. Uh, it says in verse 22, he testified to the watchers who had sinned with the daughters of men. In the ancient world, this was a general belief. I don't think there was a soul who didn't understand that, that yeah. there were fallen creatures from heaven who walked among men. Yeah, it takes modern theologians, you know, to deny yes. all this. Right. <laughs> it does. But if they would just go back and read the ancient writings, how could they, in the face of all these writings, say that they were the sons of Seth? Of Seth, yeah. You know, it's, um, or the sons of Cain. Um, also, it says in verse 23, he was taken from among the children of men. Well, there's another proof that he was translated alive into heaven with all of the other scriptures that we have. And in the passages we'll be studying today, it actually talks about his translation, his, his, uh, this mm -hmm. transformation that he underwent as he was taken into heaven. And it's an awesome description oh, too, isn't it? It, it <laughs> is. It's truly amazing. You know, here in verse 26, we should just touch on this. Uh, it says, For the Lord has four places on the earth, the Garden of Eden, the Mount of the East, the Mount which on which you, Moses, are this day, Mount Sinai and Mount Zion, which will be sanctified in the new creation for the sanctification of the earth. Yeah. So here we have in, in a, uh, an ancient writing called the Book of Jubilees, which, you know, they claim dates back to when Moses was on top of Mount Sinai. The mm -hmm. angel says to him, Moses, God has had four places, the Garden of Eden, then there was the Mount of the East. And by the way, nobody knows where that Mount of the East is, but I assume that he was referring to the mountain where God made a covenant with Noah, mm -hmm. where the ark rested, wherever that mountain is where the ark mm -hmm. uh, came to rest. And a covenant was made, and the rainbow appeared in the sky, you know. Right. This was that place where God met with men. And then there was Mount Sinai and Mount Zion, the Temple Mount today. And by the way, concerning the Temple Mount today, there's talk going around from a couple of the members of the Sanhedrin that they have had conversations with one of the top Muslim leaders and that the Muslims are warming up to this idea that the Jews could rebuild their temple on the Temple Mount next to the Mosque of Omar can you imagine such a thing? Mm. Now, we know that something like that is going to happen because Ezekiel predicts that a wall will be built to make a separation between the two sanctuaries. And John in Revelation chapter 11 measures the temple, but the court which is without the temple, God said, leave out, for it's given to the Gentiles for three and a half years. So what we've got here is a divided hilltop. It's, and, and, they're, and they're talking about that today. So these are exciting days in which to live, are they not? Oh, they are exciting days, J.R. Well, uh, to move along, <clears throat> we, we're going to go back to a time in history uh, when some very important disclosures were made, which would later uh, motivate and drive human beings, uh, specifically the 12 tribes of Israel, as they look back. Uh, you have a uh, recorded uh, quote from Josephus here, J.R., that's just really interesting. Yes, and, and this quote sort of concurs with the book, what's in the book of Jubilees. For Josephus wrote, Seth, when he was brought up, came to those years in which he could discern what was good, became a virtuous man as he himself was of an excellent character. So he did leave his children behind him who imitated his virtues, and all these proved to be of good dispositions. They also inhabited that same country without dissensions, in a happy condition, without any misfortunes falling upon them till they died. They were also the inventors of that peculiar sort of wisdom which is concerned with the heavenly bodies and their order. And, of course, what we have following, uh, in, uh, following in our studies in the book of Enoch is the book of the luminaries mm -hmm. that follows the book of the parables. So we conclude the book of the parables in this broadcast and in a future broadcast uh, sometime next month. We'll be talking about the book of the luminaries. And, of course, uh, it says here, Seth and his sons, well... Enoch was one of the great, great, great grandchildren of Seth. And uh, Seth was about 400 years old when Enoch was born. So we're not talking about people dying off here. They were all alive. And Enoch uh, got in on all of this and wrote about it. Well, let's look 
at the book of the parables. This is, this is our um, third parable, and this is the conclusion mm -hmm. of the third parable. And uh, we see this in all oh, chapters uh, 65 through 69. And uh, let's review for a moment, Gary, the first parable, which was in chapters 37 through 44, I've written here in this article. And by the way, if you don't have this, you need to get it. Uh, you can order our magazine, uh, the August 2009 issue of Prophecy in the News, and you can get this study in the book of Enoch and read it for yourself. And uh, by the way, uh, we started this series last February's issue. So if you, if you want to subscribe to Prophecy in the News for the next 12 months, if you'd like to start with last February, you can request to do so. And we'll send you February, March, April, May, June, July, and August, and then start you with the remaining uh, number of months in this 12-month series. And you can read for yourself this fascinating study in the book of the parables. And by the way, if you will subscribe to Prophecy in the News for thirty-four ninety-five, you can have your choice of four books or three videos. Just want to take this few minutes to show you The Mystery of the Menorah and the Hebrew Alphabet. That's a fascinating book we've written. Hidden Prophecies in the Song of Moses. They Pierced the Veil and Saw the Future. A study of the Twelve Minor Prophets and Guardians of the Grail. That's the story, the legend of the Holy Grail. And the men who plan to rule the world. How the Antichrist will come out of this secret society, European royalty, and so on. That's what we believe. And I'm still convinced, Gary, more than ever, that he will come out of this ancient Roman Empire. Mm -hmm. Or the royalty of Europe. And by the way, all the presidents of the United States are kin to the royalty of Europe, including our current president, believe it or not. <laughs> so anyway, you need to get these books and read them. It's a $48 value, yours free, if you will subscribe for the next 12 months to Prophecy in the News magazine. And if you want to, you can request for them to start with last February's issue. So you get all of these on the study of the book of Enoch. Well, J.R., in uh, our uh, discussion of the first parable, that's chapters 37 through 44, we noted that uh, Enoch talks about a moment of joy in heaven when the saints arrive, and uh, uh, perhaps talking about the rapture, the resurrection. Uh, in second parable, which we've looked at, the chapters 45 to 57, he actually described Messiah as the one whose blood was shed so that human beings might live. Now, this before the flood, J.R., is absolutely fantastic for yeah. him to have written this down that long ago. Right, and even for those scholars who claim that it was written in the second century B.C., that's still 200 years before the birth of Jesus right. Christ. It is. And so to say that the Messiah, whose name was hidden from among men, right, had to die for the sins of mankind is just absolutely amazing. And it also says, you know, in the second parable, that in the final battle, which we call Armageddon, the Bible calls Armageddon, Persia will instigate a war against the Holy Land and the Holy City. They name the modern Iran. I'm talking Enoch, before the flood, said that the last great battle would be perpetrated by the Parthians and the Medes. Well, that's modern day Iran. It is. Now, Gary, there are a number of chapters here that have been inserted by some bogus, shall I call him an idiot, hmm. that decided that it was okay for him to mess up the book of Enoch. And you can tell that it's bogus chapters because he calls himself Noah. And all the things he has to say are absolutely theologically stupid. Mm -hmm. They do not <clears throat> conform with the Bible or with the rest of the book of Enoch. So when you return in chapter 69 to the book of Enoch that was written by the original author of this, uh, it's such a refreshing uh, clarity in the writings of Enoch compared with those bogus chapters. So we're not going to even get into those today. We just want to take you through what we consider to be the original writings. Before we introduce chapter 69, let's back up for an introduction in chapter 64. And this is what 
we see. Enoch is watching as the kings of the earth are cast into hell. But he says, and I saw other faces in that place in secret. And I heard the voice of the angel saying, these other faces are the fallen angels that have revealed unto men that which was secret and have led astray the sons of men to commit sins. Well, Gary, that introduces chapter 69. Mm -hmm. So he, he sees these other faces and is told that they are the fallen angels. So when we get to chapter 69, we have the names of these fallen angels. Beginning with that uh, ringleader himself, he's called Samyaza. You know, just the very sound of his name is yeah. it kind of sounds wicked. Yes. Uh, and his, one of his sidekicks is called Azazel. Yes. And, and we name these angels here, that is, uh, uh, Enoch names, names them, and he names their, their structure, the way, the way they uh, comport themselves, the way they do business. And J.R., he wouldn't be able to do, this is more than just a fiction. Uh, yeah. This, this is almost a self-validating idea. Yeah, now he didn't name all 200 angels, but he no. named the heads <coughs> of the angels, okay? Mm -hmm. There's about 20 of them, or 21 of these angels. Uh, but Gary, in, in addition to Simyaza and Azazel, which by the way, they were the ringleaders. They were. And Azazel was the one who taught men to make war instruments. Right. And to make war. And there's only one other that I would like to mention among these 21. And that brings us down to verse 13. His name is Becca or Becca. And he, before he fell, the, 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 the writings of Enoch here says that he came to Michael, the archangel. Mm -hmm. And he said, would you show us the secret name? We'd like to know the secret mm -hmm. name. Now we've learned earlier in Enoch that there was a name that was secret. It was classified. The rabbis have picked up on this through the centuries and have said that this name is the Tetragrammaton. This is the ineffable, unpronounceable name of Yahweh. And so, lest they take his name in vain, the, no Jew ever pronounces the name of the yod He vav He. That's the Hebrew spelling mm -hmm. of it. <laughs> they, they will not pronounce the name of Yahweh. They call him Hashem, mm -hmm. meaning the name. Or they call him Adonai. They just don't want to call him Yahweh. But Gary, that's not the secret name at all. <laughs> it's not the secret name. As, as, as you go on down through chapter uh, uh, 69, you come to verse 26, uh, and we read this, And there was great joy among them, and they blessed and honored and exalted, because the name of the Son of Man had been revealed unto them. <laughs> now, that gives it all away. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> it's not the name of Yahweh. It's the name of Jesus, Yeshua. That was the secret name. Why was it secret? Because when Enoch wrote this book, if he had written the name Yeshua in there, the rabbis would have recognized the Messiah when he showed up. They, they would have had too much information. Yes, uh, too much information. <laughs> Now, Jesus had to keep himself, himself secret. You, when you read the four Gospels, Jesus is not showing himself. He says, don't tell any man what, this, what has happened to you, you know. In other words, he tantalizes the people in Jerusalem at the temple mm -hmm. so that they will reject him and they will nail him to the cross. He organized orchestrated, choreographed this whole thing so that he would die on Calvary. And J.R., even though uh, Enoch is not considered canonical scripture, and we don't consider it that, it validates the Word of God. Uh, verse 27, he sat upon the throne of glory and some of judgment was given to him. That's the Son of Man. And he causes to disappear, to be destroyed, the sinners from the face of the earth, and also those who have led astray the earth. In other words, he sits as judge uh, at the right hand of God. Enoch wrote that. Yeah. centuries, millennia ago, 
It's New Testament stuff, really. Yes, yes and he's going to be given a kingdom. Well, listen to the power in this name. This, this is verse 15. This is the power of that oath. So, Becca, mm -hmm. by the way, Becca sounds familiar, doesn't it? Well, there is a Becca Valley in uh, Lebanon, which is, it lies at the foot of Mount Hermon, yeah. which is the gate of the ancient gods. Uh, that's where the fallen angels were said to have come down. So maybe yeah. Mecca's so name is immortalized. Got, here we've got Simyaza and Azazel and Becca. Yeah. And they were the infamous among those 200 fallen angels that came down to Mount Hermon. And Becca was evidently so popular, they named a valley after him. And uh, that valley runs all the way up to uh, Baalbek, uh, doesn't it? It's near the, the Baalbek Acropolis, which, by the way, is devoted to the ancient super gods, the demigods, the giants. Yeah. The, you know, the flooring stones of the Baalbek Acropolis, JR, are each the size of two boxcars placed end to end, and it's said that no human being could possibly have moved them. Well, somebody had to build them. Somebody did. Amazing, huh? So Becca comes to Michael and he says, tell us the secret name that they might see that secret name, that they might mention this name in the oath, that they might tremble before that name and the oath. And those that showed to the children of men all that is secret. So Becca wanted to reveal the secret name probably to the sons of men. Well, that would have thrown a monkey wrench into the whole works. But listen to the power of that oath. For it's powerful and strong, he says, and he placed this oath, uh, Acha, into the hands of the holy Michael. And verse 16, now these are the secrets of that oath. Verse 17, by it the earth was formed. Verse 18, and by it the sea was created. 19, and by that oath the depths were strengthened. Verse 20, and by that oath the sun and moon complete their course and depart not from their commands from eternity to eternity. In verse 21, and by that oath the stars complete their courses. Verse 23, and in it are preserved the repositories of the voice of thunder and of the light of the lightnings and so on. You get the picture here. He says, verse 25, over them this oath is strong and they are preserved by it. Gary, we're talking creation here. And who did the creating? According to Enoch, the Son of Man. And yeah. that's exactly what the New Testament says. So John, in chapter 1 of his gospel, says, In the beginning was the Word. Right. And by Him all things were created. And then he says, And by the way, without Him was not anything created that was made. <laughs> so, Gary, this name of Jesus yeah. is powerful. Yeah. And when it was finally revealed to the sons of men, there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. It is the name of Jesus, not the name of Yahweh, not the ineffable name of the Jehovah of the Old Testament, not the I am that I am is the name. It is Yeshua. That's the name. And you know, Gary, in the book of Acts, we are told that in the name of Jesus, Demons were cast out. Mm -hmm. In the name of Jesus, the lame were healed. In the name of Jesus, salvation is given to those who call upon the name. For in Romans chapter 10, it's, it tells us, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus rose from the dead, mm -hmm. thou shalt be saved. Well, the very name of Jesus in Hebrew, Yeshua, means salvation. That's who he is. That's what he does. Yes. And Enoch knew that. And it's, it's written all through uh, the chapters of Enoch. Well, J.R., uh, we've just come out at 69, chapter 69. We still have 70 and 71 well, ahead of let, us. Let me read verse 29, okay? okay? Well, maybe from, I'm moving ahead too fast. It's all right. From that time on... There will be nothing that will be destroyed. This is the messianic kingdom he's mm -hmm. talking about. For he is the son of man. The son of man has appeared and sits on his throne of glory and all wickedness disappeared before his face and depart that the word of the son of man will be strong before the Lord of the spirits. Period. This is the third 
parable of Enoch. Mm. So he concludes the third parable with Jesus sitting upon the throne, ruling as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Wow. Amazing. J.R., a thought just came into my head. Once Ezekiel was visited by a whirling chariot, and which came down and stood before him, and he saw in that chariot one who had the appearance of the Son of Man. Same yeah. person. Yes. Same person. So let's get to chapter 70 and 71 now. <clears throat> chapter 70 and 71 uh, is most fascinating because they lead up to the translation of Enoch. In other words, we've all heard how Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him. And people traditionally say, well, he was just translated into heaven. Well, this actually documents that event. Yes, it does. And it came to pass after this that his name was elevated during his lifetime to that Son of Man, to the Lord of the Spirit. So Jesus is the one who signed off on his translation. Yes, like absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Away from those that dwell on the earth. And it was elevated on wagons of the Spirit, and his name departed in their midst. Elevated on the wagons of the Spirit. Gary, that's, that's a chariot. A chariot. <laughs> As a matter of fact, those chariots are seen all through the Old Testament. Uh, when you read Daniel, he talks about the Ancient of Days who ha has had hair uh, like pure white wool. And he talked about a fiery stream from before him and wheels of fire that issued forth from his throne. Uh, J.R., these fiery wheels seem to be those wagons or chariots that we're talking about. Yes, and we're not talking about horse-drawn chariots here. We're oh, talking no. about celestial vehicles. Right. Uh, disc-shaped vehicles, K you know, kind of like the ones people claim to be seeing for the last 40, 50 years <laughs> since 1948. So we have in Genesis 6, 24, Enoch walked with God and he was not for God took him. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 5, by faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased. God. Wow. Fascinating, isn't it? It is, J.R. And here in verse 5, chapter 71, the Spirit moved Enoch into the heaven of heavens, and I saw there in the midst of the light how there was something which was built of crystal of stone, and between these stones, tongues, the living fire. He's now at the throne of God. Yeah. Translated. Yeah, translated. Translated, folks. I'm J.R. Church, Gary Stearman. Until next time, keep looking up.